Okay, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Um, I'm zooming in here from Brooklyn, New York, and uh, I'm Matt Britton, the CEO of Suzy, and I'm joined by a very special guest today. Uh, Rick Stringer is here from Crayola. Rick, thank you so much for joining. Great to have oh, my you. My pleasure. My pleasure. It's great to be here. Rick is the VP of the Customer Leadership Center at Crayola. Rick, what is the Customer Leadership Center at Crayola? Yeah, so the CLC is a uh, center of excellence for category management, shopper insights, business intelligence, primarily focused on syndicated data and triangulating all that to help our customers win with activation strategies to drive category growth. And I'm sure it's been just a crazy time at Crayola with all the changes that the last five or six months has seen on your business, just like every other major brand. Yes, indeed. It has been a most interesting back to school, most interesting year. It's funny, you go back to March when the uh, pandemic hit and we saw a lot of schools starting to close down. Our category actually experienced triple digit growth for a month straight as parents were looking for in-home solutions for the kids. Yep. And now you fast forward to back to school and it's proving to be interesting as well because there's so much uncertainty Exactly. Not only when will my kids go back, but how will they go back, right? Absolutely. So. And we don't, the funny thing is like, not funny, it's the wrong choice of words. The interesting thing about the situation is we don't know when we'll know, right? And that's what we'll get into today is it's not like there's a date where every teacher and every parent and every student's going to be told, okay, here's the plan. It's just very much a, you know, we'll decide as we go along. And that makes it so hard for everybody involved. You know, that's exactly right, Matt. And I, I'm hearing stories from folks just within my network, anecdotal stories of, well, this is what I was told four to eight hours ago. It just changed again. Right. <laughs> and as a result, there's a stagnation of, hey, how do I get my child ready? You know, that traditional trip of going to retail to buy new shoes, new clothes, supplies has kind of been on pause here as we move into uh, September. Absolutely. And on that note, you know, we thought that it would be of great interest to our audience to really dive deeper into back to school. Back to school is one of those huge seasonal temples along with um, timelines like holiday um, and obviously dads and grads going into the summer. And there's these big seasonal temples that retailers and brands really rely on to drive their business. And who better to, to give expert analysis and opinion um, than Rick, who is from, you know, obviously Crayola, one of the most prominent brands in back to school. So we're going to be really diving in today to how teachers, students and schools and consumers are really preparing for an uncertain school year, unlike none, no other. Uh, those of you who've joined us throughout the State of the Consumer webinars we've been hosting since March are very familiar with our uh, product and our brand right now, Susie, for, for those of you who uh, all right. Suzy is a real-time market research software tool that really helps businesses and brands of all sizes have their finger on the pulse of the consumer by allowing them to ask consumers of all types, questions of all types, to get real-time feedback to help drive business decisions. Uh, we used our tool, Suzy, to conduct a market research study, which in part is going to be fueling our insights that we're going to be delivering to everybody today. The study that we will be referencing that Suzy conducted today was conducted on August 11th with a sample size of 1,000 parents and 500 teachers and school administrators. So again, we talked to not only parents of students going back to schools, but also the people who are working within the education world to see how they're looking at this brand new world. Uh, I want to thank everybody for joining. Um, I can't believe, again, we're still in August. I remember very much so our first webinar we did in March back in our office. We have not been back in our office ever since, um, but I hope everybody is doing well and enjoying the, the last bits of summer that we have here in late August. So today we're gonna to be going back to school uh, with Crayola. And as Rick was really just mentioning, there is so much uncertainty this year for back to school. And the, other, the only certainty in some ways is the uncertainty. Students don't know when they're going to be able to be in their classrooms with their friends. Teachers don't know if they should be preparing for a full year remotely or, or a partial year where they're going to be part remote and part in school. Schools themselves are trying to figure out how are we going to um, lay out our classrooms? How are we going to be able to account for students possibly coming into our facilities in a world of social distancing? How's everything from the class breaks happen when kids are walking into hallways to lunchroom time? 
going to change. We've already seen in various cities across the country and various um, suburbs schools opening back up to not great results. We had some schools really try to not only just, uh, you know, K through 12, but major colleges and universities. We just saw University of North Carolina try to open back up fully. They instantly shut down when they had an outbreak at schools. So the early indications are schools are not going to be very easily adept to reopening without major bumps in the road which could cause them to course correct really instantly. And for those of you who know, especially K through 12 education, this wasn't exactly the fastest moving sector going into this. You know, the education sector has long been a laggard compared to other major industry sectors in terms of adopting change, adopting technology. And now all of a sudden you have the, the education, you know, industry really being pushed to adopt change so rapidly. And with that, many are struggling, especially, you know, in the public sector, you know, Department of Educations across the country that really are an adept to um, a remote environment, a technology driven environment. And now they have no choice but to try to embrace it for the better of the teachers and, and the students at their schools. So uh, we are certainly in unprecedented times. For parents, you know, their main concern has been, I want to make sure that my kids can still learn. I want to make sure that they have the personal de and social development um, and, and they can learn and grow during these critical years. And whether you have a child that's entering first grade or you have a child that's preparing to enter college and they're maybe in 10th grade or 11th grade, you know, these years are all so critical. And if you think about your childhood, and if you were being plucked out of your school environment for a year, a year and a half, what would that do to your upbringing and your personal development? It's, it's really scary. And I think because of that, parents are incredibly concerned right now about making sure um, in a variety of different ways that they're giving their kid all the opportunities that they can learn and grow. And I think that is where the challenge lies. And I think we all can play a role, whether we're, you know, brands, and we're talking about the brand's role and actually helping parents and students kind of navigate through this. Obviously the teachers and as parents trying to figure out how to best chart our course uh, moving forward. 43% uh, of parents have drastically changed their schedule in order to accommodate school closings. Uh, we've read about this at nauseam and we've done uh, several webinars about you know, remote work and how not only obviously are we dealing with the, the, the harsh fact that students can't go back to school, but at the same time we're dealing with the fact that we don't have an office to go to. And many parents obviously cannot afford childcare to take care of their kids or to make sure their kids are getting the appropriate attention. And at the same time, we're facing an economic downturn and many workers really have to focus on the job. So what you find is many parents really juggling and trying to juggle the needs of both their kids um, and obviously their career in a often small space uh, with limited bandwidth and internet access, limited equipment to be able to do so. So obviously these, these, these drastic schedule changes can involve anything from parents sleeping less, waking up more early, to income households juggling um, parental responsibilities, people working out of closets, you name it, just to get through this time. And it's something that I think brands really need to be conscious of when they look at how can I actually aid my consumer in actually getting through this. Teachers, as we mentioned, are still waiting to see if their schools are reopening. And that it obviously is a big deal because teachers in many instances are in charge of formulating the curriculums for school. And if they don't know if the curriculum is going to be remote or virtual or hybrid, it could drastically impact the way that they actually execute their learning plan. So, and they're going to have to really pivot in a way that they weren't really trained to do. You know, these aren't entrepreneurs that are going into an environment and trying to react. These are teachers who are well trained to go about um, classroom learning a certain way. And there's not enough time right now, frankly, to teach um, these, these educators and how to respond. So many of them are really making it up as they go along, as so many of us are on parents. Um, teachers are obviously very concerned too about, you know, their own health. Uh, this is a story about a teacher making a spreadsheet of tracking um, all the instances of COVID that's actually happened in schools already. And she already has more than 700 instances that she's aware of. You know, these are teachers that are putting their own health um, on the line of going to school. And many, frankly, are against it. And they're kind of being brought in against their better wishes to go into schools, while other teachers really do want to actually be back in school. We talked a little bit about with Rick about the uncertainty at the open here. And you look at the Google search, uh, you know, of 
Google search volume of will schools reopen? You see that continues to be that way. Parents and teachers still obviously don't know. Um, 60% of children aren't sure if they're going to be in home or in school come September. We are in late August right now at this point, and parents still, children still aren't uh, sure if they're going to be going back to school or not. So the expectations in terms of if they're going to see their friends, if they're going to um, be walking or taking a bus to school, they actually still don't know. And that becomes a challenge in terms of how parents are going to communicate this to kids um, in the weeks ahead. So today we're going to be exploring three main topics, given all the uncertainty between parents and students and teachers. We're going to talk about the challenges parents face. We're going to talk about how parents are preparing. And we're going to talk about the impact on teachers um, of the current situation. And hopefully we'll also have time uh, you know, for questions from our audience. I know that this is an issue that impacts many of our audience, not just from a personal level, uh, because they have kids at home, but obviously also from a business level because they are in the business of selling products and services that are really highly dependent upon this back to school season. So first we're going to talk about the challenges. Before we do so, we're going to go into our Ask America segment that we do um, every single webinar where we give you, the audience, the ability to tell us what question you want us to ask from our Susie panel, which we'll have answer at the end of the webinar. Um, so the four questions you can choose from is, what has been your favorite part of having your child at home? What has been your least favorite part of having your child at home? What brands do you expect to help you if your child remains home? And which brands will you continue not to purchase for your child? regardless of if schools open or not. So you can quickly select what question you want to answer and we will go into the first section of our webinar. So despite the fact that many parents have changed their schedules, you also have 73% of parents trying to maintain some sense of normalcy. Um, and in their uh, desire to have some type of control, we're seeing parents really trying to reinvent ways that they organize their family. For those of you who know the tool Trello, Trello is a project management school, uh, a project management tool that until now is really reserved for major enterprise companies. And it really allows them to create pretty complex scheduling uh, regiments for different parts of organizations. Well, guess what? Now parents are actually deploying Trello to actually plan their kids' homeschooling. So uh, because there's so many moving parts, again, in terms of dual, um, dual uh, income households where you have both parents that need to work, they need to organize their work schedules in conjunction with their kids' schedules in a way that makes sure that everyone's successful. So I just thought this is so interesting in terms of parents are now looking at their home almost like a functioning company in terms of the tools and the processes that they need to be able to execute properly uh, for the back to school season. 47% um, of, of, of parents are actually expecting to be their child's teacher this year. And that won't be an easy feat. So many kids are struggling with remote learning environments. They, they have a hard time focusing. There's too many distractions at home. And because of it, many parents are actually jumping in, nearly half actually, and saying, I'm your new teacher this fall. I'm going to be the one that's actually going to walk you through all your classes um, with the curriculum that's set by a school. And again, this is completely new territory uh, for parents. So it's given really the parent the role of, um, you know, of the teacher, along with being the role of the cook, disciplinarian, the entertainer, and the babysitter. So really, it's just so much to juggle for parents in terms of the things that they're thinking of. Because normally, again, during a normal school day, they wouldn't have to be any of these things, right? They have a teacher. The, the school is providing lunch. The school is providing the discipline. They're having after school activities or other ways to entertain themselves. They are, they're, they're actually obviously being um, overseen, so there's not a need for a babysitter. So these are all additional roles that parents have actually said they now need to take on as a result of this crisis. And this was an interesting quote that we got from Danielle. So much anxiety trying to figure out how I'm supposed to work a full time job and homeschool Mackenzie. If anyone has any tips on becoming a millionaire so I can quit my job, let me know. And on that front, the wealthy side in the world of such wealth disparity are actually spending up to seventy thousand dollars for their kids this fall, creating these pods. You see it a lot with families in the San Francisco area, New York area, et cetera, where a bunch of them are coming together, actually paying the salary of a teacher, giving um, space in their home up where they're rotating and actually teaching their kids. Now, obviously, this is an option that's available for a select few. And many think that this entire crisis is just expanding uh, you know, this disparity. Uh, because obviously only a select amount of families have the opportunity and the means to be able to give kids a hands-on hands -on education. 
while the families that don't, you know, they're going to be even further set back because they don't have access to something like this. So I think that's another interesting byproduct of all this. Um, so obviously, nearly half parents are saying that their biggest challenge is balancing um, all the responsibilities. And, you know, the, the anxiety that parents has really go across the board. This came directly from our Susie panel um, saying everything from they just don't know the impact of the lack of socialization, um, that there, there's so much that's on their shoulders. And generally speaking, there's just so much uncertainty in terms of when this is going to end. And that's really where the anxiety rests um, on, in terms of parents themselves and how they're feeling about the whole situation. Um, and even if there is a back to school, even if school opens up, over half are worried. Uh, they're worried about, again, the health of their age, regardless um, you know, of the kid's age or where they live, et cetera. And again, as I mentioned earlier, there's just so much um, you know, negativity that's coming out of the schools that actually did try to open early. So parents obviously have many different responsibilities. We mentioned entertainers, one of them, and we asked them, what are you doing to you know, keep your kids entertained uh, you know, in between school or you know, this summer going into the fall? Is everything from watching more movies, starting to cook together, starting to exercise together. We talked about the, the rise of DIY and arts and crafts projects. Rick, I don't know how much of that you've seen putting aside back to school, but just let's talk about the summer and maybe even going back to as early as April. What impact did all this have on your business in terms of parents needing to entertain their kids at home? Yeah, it's massive. Couple areas there. Um, there was, in essence, some time at uh, a, a fluency. People had more time to be at home with their kids. So traditionally, you know, you want to go to the non mess things, give them a crayon and a coloring book. We actually saw a massive spike in paint, glue, modeling compounds. So the stuff that is more artsy versus crafty started to take off. And we saw a massive increase in sales there. We also noticed a massive increase in digital content. So show me some craft projects that we can do together, provide that instruction. Right. And I want it to last a little longer than normal. You know, usually it's as quick as possible, get them to work here. They're actually looking for, Hey, 15 to 20 minutes of instruction to keep them engaged is a time saver for me. And it allows me to commingle my job with everything else I have to do in the home. So it's actually been really positive for our category. I think that's just so interesting because you look at what your brand has been traditionally and it's to create and sell good products. But right now that's not enough because you actually need to educate parents on what to do with the products, right? So you almost have to be as much of an enabler as you are a manufacturer and a producer. Yes, and it, and it does shine on, you know, Crayola has what we call CIY, which create it yourself. And these are just easy videos that you can follow along. Again, they've got the time. The beauty of it as well is you can almost memorialize the moment. There's a definitive outcome that you can decorate the home with. You can celebrate. Yeah. And we found that emotional connection is also resonating as well during these tough times. Have you guys thought about doing anything with, because I, I say it all the time in the food and beverage space where like families are cooking together and it's a great opportunity for a brand to come in and do something where they can enable the family to cook, but also do so in a way that connects their friends to maybe cook the other, this the same uh, dish remotely. Like, have you guys thought about <laughs> making that more of a virtual project? Like have five of your uh, friends all bring their kids together, all go on a zoom together. Your video will be in one quarter and you all can create together. I think it's a great idea and it's something we should look at. I think it's a fantastic idea because again, the beauty of our product is the outcome is unique to that person, right? And when right. you pair that in a group, it just creates a discussion and dialogue, which is what great art's all about anyway. So it's really Yeah, good. because because I think while people are craving stuff to do, they're also craving community. And right. I and think actually, with these like Zoom birthday parties and people getting online is that they don't really have the common thread on what to talk about. It's not like they just, they, they can't talk about the party they went to or what happened at the office. There's a, so if they had an activity, now you actually have a common topic to actually aggregate and galvanize conversation around. And if your yeah. brand be at the center of it, I think it's a great way to pull people together. You know, it's uh, interesting. You mentioned that um, one area that we did see massive growth was sidewalk chalk. And yeah. you know, chalks where you're sending a message, you're expressing yourself and you can post that. Massive growth in that area as well from a consumption standpoint. Yeah. And I love the idea of memorializing. I mean, hopefully we, you know, we move ahead two to three years and we look at this as distant memory. And maybe one of the only things that we'll have as a souvenir is some of the products created 
uh, you know, with your tools in the home during this period. But, uh, right. you know, it, 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 it's interesting also when parents are saying oh, we want things to take longer. But I think these are the type of activities I think parents will look back at and they will remember not so much staring at, you know, Netflix. And I think right. that's, you know, I think that they can make the most of it. And if your brand can be at the center and other brands that are in your category, I think that's a great thing. Yes. So, um, yeah, and so tech companies are also obviously um, engaging. Audible is now offering free audiobooks for kids stuck at home. So I think the notion of a brand being an enabler and actually helping parents get through this, again, as we head to back to school, um, you know, brands like Crayola, you know, Rick and his team have the ability to actually be creative and actually come up with new ways to use the products where a company like Audible, they're going to say, okay, we're just going to give you um, free audiobooks because it's going to actually mm -hmm. help. And I think that's going to have a continued role actually moving forward. Um, and in that note, nearly 50% of parents wish there was more brand developed content as an incentive to keep kids more productive. I mean, I think one thing us as marketers often forget is that most parents actually don't have the ability to come up instantly with these new creative ways to keep their kids busy. So it's not that they don't want to spend money on products. It's not that they don't want to take the time. They're just looking for things and ideas. And so I think, again, content has should have really evolved through this crisis mm -hmm. From being a, a nice to have to really having a must have because it's not really just playing the role as advertising anymore right it's not just trying to build brand awareness it's actually to try to activate the purpose of the brand and the product in the home because parents are again facing a whole new normal and don't really know how to act and live in these times that's right yeah so rick how do you guys know what content to create like how do you know you know, what types of activities you should actually be pushing to the forefront in terms of your content? Yeah, a lot of it is understanding the seasons we're in. So we're an occasion-based category. As you can imagine, if it's Halloween, if it's um, on the go, if you're getting outside, Valentine's Day, any time to celebrate is a big one. We also know that mediums are a big deal. So compounds, we have a product called Model Magic. It's scoff, squishy, yeah. modeling material. Not a lot of household awareness. It's a perfect project to engage your kids in something that's unique, fun, and different. And it's beyond that normal of just coloring. Yeah. And we find that that's what's working and resonating most right now is a definitive outcome that they can localize to their own color choices, um, subject matter. And we provide just enough direction to kind of kick them in that way. Right. And then they're through what they create. And that's the magic of it all. That is. That's awesome. Um, so, you know, you, you're talking about the resources you guys have created. Mm -hmm. I've talked about how you get the information you're getting. Are you doing things like also soliciting feedback from your customers? Like, you know, how how is that feedback loop actually happening with Crayola so you can actually see how your content is being put into use in the home? That's exactly right. So we're monitoring, listening, just to understand how are our products being used how can we ensure that you know we, we catch something early, we provide the CIY content, the videos, the direction, and it can scale that way. That's been a, uh, a big factor this year, especially. That's great. So in some way, in terms of the challenges parents are facing, you know, they're feeling anxious about what the school year will look like, you know, the amount of work that needs to be juggled. They're really struggling for ways to keep their kids entertained going into the fall. And you know, they want to make sure that they can have the not only the close connections with their kids, but actually obviously to facilitate those close connections between their kids and their peers. And, you know, we talked about some of the ways that Crayola as a brand um, is really helping. And I think to me, this is really how all brands need to look at their communications right now. It shouldn't be about pushing your unique selling proposition, you know, 30% more absorbent V6, you know, 350 horsepower. It's really about being an enabler in the, in the areas that your brand has the right to play to help your consumer get through this. And if your brand could be at the center, not only will it help drive volume today, but it'll build brand equity that will last for years. And I think it's a whole different way of looking at things. It's really driving that, accelerating that shift from advertising to content, which we've been, oh, so many of us have been shouting from the rooftops on really since the birth of the social media era uh, over 10 years ago. So next we're going to move into preparation. Um, and before we jump into our section on preparation, how parents are preparing for the back to school season, we're going to ask America uh, and ask you, which of the four questions you'd like us to ask our Susie audience? One, how much time do you feel you need to prepare for your child's back to school? Two, how much money do you plan on spending on back to school? Three, what is your biggest concern when preparing for back to school? 
and four, what is your child's biggest concern with going back to school? So you can go ahead and select a question that you'd like us to ask our audience, and we will move on to the preparation section. Oh, and it looks like we have a pop-up. Um, by the way, if anybody um, needs their own insights for back to school, um, you know, questions that you want us to ask our audience that can help you make better business decisions for back to school, uh, you can reach out before the end of the webinar and we're happy to give you a free question on the Suzy platform just to show you how it works and to try to um, you know, give you a little bit more knowledge about your consumer. So 38% of parents are planning on sending their uh, children back to school in person, while 40% are still deciding. So as we've mentioned, things are very much in the air. Um, and Rick, how do you think that impacts the type of products, I guess, that consumers are want to purchasing? How do parents of remote learning kids versus parents of in-school kids impact, I guess, their, their preparation? Yeah, this is a big deal, Matt. Um, you know, traditionally with the physical school start, teachers are finalizing their back to school list, in some cases, April, May, to get ready right. for the next year. And because of this year, that was stunted. They were schooling from home. They weren't sure how school was going to go back. So they didn't even complete their back to school list. And to give you a sense of the scale from the elementary grades, so figure K through fifth grade, over 90% of teachers are publishing a back to school list. That list of supplies is generally around 15 items. You're looking at north of $30 in retail value. And because that has been stunted and put on hold, you don't have that mile marker for parents. What we've learned is when parents start to see the back to school supply ads, they get the list. That's their trigger that now I've right. got to start preparing. And it's been the exact opposite. Just get me through summer. I'm not even ready to start thinking about back to school yet. So we're working through that. The other thing that's um, interesting too is that um, depending on the format. So for instance, if your child's going back in a hybrid situation and some work we did uh, with uh, Susie last week, we learned about 35% of kids are hybrid. They're in school on Monday, they're home on Tuesday. 60% of those kids are getting two lists, a list of supplies to have at home and a list of supplies to have at school, where the virtual kids haven't even received a list yet. So it's truly the most dynamic back to school list when it comes to supply purchases. We think this year it's really more about back in school versus back to school. The back to, to school was the preparation to get them ready to go to school I think this year parents are waiting, let me get my child back in school and I'll figure out what they need based on direction from the school and the teacher. Wow, so much to consider, so many moving yeah. parts still. So Absolutely. About it. Um, so obviously, um, you know, parents are sending their children back uh, for multiple reasons, like the ones who, who decide they want them to get into a school environment. One, they want their children to get the full scope of the education. Two, they want them to get back to a routine and they want them to be able to socialize. Four would probably be they just want to get them out of the house. Um, but, you know, they certainly see value um, in them being in a school environment. Um, however, some, 37% uh, say their child has really adapted to remote learning. I mean, I have two kids. One of my kids actually, I think, has done a great job at um, really going with the flow and now has gotten to a new way of looking at education where she says she's more productive and learns more remotely. Well, my other uh, child actually, um, you know, does not do well in a remote environment, does much better being around other people. So I think every kid based upon, um, you know, their tendencies will look at um, either virtual, um, just like us as workers, right? Virtual or, or in person, more or less effective. And, and it's really a personal choice um, in terms of um, what is best for, you, for your kid. So we talked about preparation and what people will be buying. And Rick, you talked about uh, these back to school lists. And um, I think this goes part and parcel with what you were saying. There's still a whole lot of shopping to be done this year. I mean, I was shocked at this, but it looks like about 42% of parents have not started or have, or have done a majority of shopping. And that's double what it was in 2018. Yeah, this for me, if you distill the back to school supply season down into one slide, this is it. So this was done. <laughs> And you're absolutely right, Matt, a double in the percent of households that are saying, hey, I either haven't started or I've got to do all my shopping left. And I'd also point out these are households that plan to buy back to school supplies. So definitely a stunted compressed season. We think the season will peak probably three to four weeks later than normal. And um, this is just the state of where they are. Yep. And, you know, obviously. 
parents are looking for some guidance. Uh, 44% of parents are waiting to hear from schools and teachers on guidance. Um, I can speak for myself, the, the school my kids go to, it's like a lot of, we have one call after the other, but you're not really learning anything new because no one really knows who the arbiter of that guidance is. Who is the person yeah. that's going to tell them? So it's not, it, it's frustrating to everybody involved because the guidance it, isn't coming down the way I think parents are used to it coming down. You know, it's funny, Matt. One of the, the survey questions we asked just to kind of gauge this was um, 60% of households told us that they're definitely or highly likely will need to buy more school supplies after school starts. And again, that's much higher than we traditionally see because it's back to school. Again, this back in school and once they start, I think we're going to see a series of mini back to school seasons emerge this fall depending on the local district when it goes back and how it goes back. Absolutely. 57% um, of parents uh, either will use their uh, own list or, or you know, uh, what, what a teacher school decide what to buy, which we talked about the importance of those lists that are coming in. Traditionally, parents were relying on these official lists, but now many of them are being left to their own devices. Um, and now is around the time that parents expect to hear what to buy from school. So, you know, it's, it's about the time when parents are expecting to be told. And again, many aren't, or many are getting sort of mixed information and it's really confusing them in terms of how to uh, prepare. So, um, you know, right now, the way that parents are looking at it, Rick, and I, I don't know if this comes interesting to you or not, but m most parents are not buying anything unusual from the typical back to school list right now. There's staples there. I guess they're still need, they feel they need to pick up regardless. Yeah, that's exactly right. We've been doing a lot of market basket analysis just to understand what we've learned essentially is the basket is as high as it's ever been. It's actually an increase. There's just fewer baskets as shoppers wait. But the yeah. core essentials, your coloring tools, your cutting tools, um, your glue, your paper, still generally the, the supplies that kids normally use is still in play. Yeah, one of the biggest, obviously, booms is, is happening in the technology um, space because obviously you need technology m much more so uh, in a virtual world. 20% um, of parents are going to be buying technology this year that they haven't before. Um, obviously, these are the higher ticket items that parents have to purchase, whether they're purchasing a, a laptop or a webcam um, or a mouse and keyboard monitor a desk um you know the things that the heavy lifting items that many parents now have to purchase for their kids that probably weren't in their back to school budgets um in fact we've seen that just the the laptop demand is so historic that there's now shortages there's laptop shortages obviously laptops are things that have a very involved supply chain and involved in many different components that are made um all over the world many of which um, of those components are developed in china and that's a uh, whole nother webinar in its own in terms of um, the supply chain and, and China's um, you know, role in that. But because of that, we are seeing just a dramatic shortage of laptops. And if kids don't have computers, um, you know, first of all, many families can't afford to buy laptops for their kids, first and foremost, uh, you know, where unemployment currently is, et cetera. But even parents who have the means to be able to purchase those laptops, you know, we could you know, face a, a situation where they're not even available. Um, not to mention proliferation of high-speed Wi-Fi and so many things I think many of us information workers take for granted in terms of what allows us to do our job every day. Well, students need the same thing, and it's going to be interesting to see how this evolves um, heading into the back-to-school year. Uh, not only do parents need the equipment, but they also, many uh, families find themselves more technically illiterate than not. You know, they haven't had to use tools like Zoom or project management tools like Trello or understand how to set up the right lighting um, or, or sound to be able to give their kids the appropriate tools that they can thrive in a remote environment. So here you have an Alabama school district giving one-on-one -on -one technical help for remote learning families, almost like a geek squad, if you will. I think there's a huge opportunity there for companies, um, especially in the, in the consumer electronics technology space, to actually help parents with the same type of content that Rick's talking about. They're giving to parents to help them um, you know, be creative with their kids in, in the home for, for technology companies to say, we're gonna help you set up the right equipment so your kids can feel like uh, you know, they're at their best to be able to learn this upcoming back to school season. 
Um, you know, 37% of, of parents, are, as Rick mentioned, are buying more school supplies than they did last year. Um, you know, we are looking at this whole crisis as, you know, the world of haves and have nots. If you're in the, you know, airline sector or hospitality sector, um, your volume certainly isn't higher than it's ever been. But certain categories, um, such as school supplies, obviously we talked about the CPG space, food and beverage, et cetera, happen to be doing very well right now. And we're seeing this reflected here. Um, so parents need to, why are parents buying more? Um, first of all, many parents find that they need to buy more virus related safety products. So, mm -hmm. uh, one thing that's on the list this year for many parents for back to school shopping as in the past mess, uh, you know, many parents, um, are now have to put mess into their budget. Um, they need to buy both for home and school. Um, they want to stock up and many are also being philanthropic and buying products to donate. Um, so I, I, I thought this was a really interesting thing. Uh, Rick, if you want to speak to it, Crayola's new face mask for kids. You know, let's talk about that. Yeah, so we have a licensed partner that's put face masks together. Very successful. Again, it's a form of creative expression, right? You can yeah. Favorite colors. You're keeping your kids safe. Um, been very successful. And uh, again, took some nimbleness to react quickly to this, but I think we're starting to see. You mentioned this earlier, Matt, with supply chains, um, a nimbleness on the back end of how organizations react to this and how quickly you can move from content through to execution and development. It's been pretty interesting. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Curiously, when you market a product like a face mask, which mm -hmm. is obviously more medical in nature than anything Crayola has ever marketed and sold in the past, how do you look at the messaging for something like that? You mentioned like a creative outlet, but it's also something that at its core is meant to help kids not contract a virus. So, yeah, I would say in, in this particular case, um, this is where we depend on a licensed partner to help us with sure. and it creates a really good partnership. Um, we know where our strengths are and our core capabilities and when to lean on partners. And in this case, um, you, you figure out that balance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, so, so I agree on, on being nimble as a company, understanding how to be dynamic and it creates opportunity. You know, I think exactly. the companies that have been able to since the beginning pivot hard, figure out where the market is headed and respond accordingly are the ones that, yep. you know, put themselves in the best position to succeed through this. Indeed. Um, where are parents buying from? I mean, obviously, where is everybody buying everything from? Amazon to start off with, but Amazon and Walmart um, are really the retailers. Any any changes in channel um, that we think, you know, just things that have yeah. popped up that we should know about? Yeah, this is an interesting one. Can you, as you can imagine, CPG, you want to win that list trip. You've got that supply list. What we've seen this year, and we we did some survey work to understand how different was it. And about thirty five percent of shoppers said, "Hey, I shop the same way, same retailer, same format." But you can also see over a third went to new retailers this year. They use click and collect different formats and ecosystems for shopping. We've seen a, uh, a resurgence, or uh, not a surge, but a surge in the, uh, the value channel, the convenience, your dollar generals, your family dollars, easy in, easy out. We've seen click and collect, uh, e-com, ship to home, absolutely um, increase as a share of format. So yeah. it's definitely been a very dynamic season so far. And again, we think the season is yet to peak, so a lot more to come, but... Um, the, the, the thing that's interesting about this is understanding too, because you've had to accelerate the shopability of understanding how to shop screen back, whether that's through an Instacart, whether that's through uh, a click and collect curbside Bopus, you know, it's to see how much of that traction picks up as we move into holiday and beyond. So we're yeah. going to be monitoring and keeping an eye on that as well. Another thing I'm just thinking out loud in terms of what may be happening in terms of delayed buying as well is, in the past, parents short would take their kids away for maybe a week for summer vacation, but generally they would be at their, you know, where they live on a primary basis for most of the summer, where now you have many families that have, you know, went to a second home or stayed with family or gotten out of the city and haven't been in their primary residence for months. And now many are actually coming back, um, you know, and now all of a sudden they're wow, I have to prepare for school. Like the real world yeah. is slowly turning back on. So you do that shift. I know that's, that, that's more of an insight about urban dwelling families, but that's a big piece, obviously, of the overall spend. And it's just something that's interesting. Yeah, without a doubt. And that'll be something that we'll be monitoring very closely over the next few weeks.
So, um, you know, we talked about, you know, how parents are staying, uh, you know, entertained, but, you know, what parents want from brands is ultimately provide good quality, help with online learning, be safe, be positive, help them be engaging, creative. I mean, these are all areas I think, you know, Crayola. Yeah, this really was, with. Sorry, Matt, this is one that we, we dove into as well. And what we learned was that parents also said, hey, I don't want to have to micromanage a project if they're online. Make it easy so my child can understand how to do it. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. For themselves, and you know that's that's dual benefits. The parent gets some time; they get a half an hour to get some work done. The child's engaged. There's a self of a, a sense of accomplishment, all playing into that digital content and how it's created and shared. So, and these are other examples. Lego um, had uh, you know helpful resources to help, to help support their kids, um, even in the technology space. Um, so, you know. Lego is getting into the virtual learning space, hybrid learning. You can see how they've actually built their Lego education site. It's about virtual hybrid at home. Um, educators really trying to figure out how they're going to market their brand in this new world um, of uncertainty and also has played a lot in the content as well. So I think, you know, the leading brand in this space understand their new role and how they have to really reprioritize the way they communicate uh, with their consumers. Um, obviously traditions, back to school traditions, is the big piece, uh, Rick, I don't know if you want to talk about how traditions have changed too. Oh my uh, God. Consumers. Yeah. Yeah. You think about, you know, we, we've done some psychographic profiling of the back to school shopper and we know there's a quarter out there that it's a big deal. You know, it's a full day. You're doing lunch, you're taking the kids out, you're buying clothes yeah. you're buying shoes, you're buying supplies and all of that has changed. So you're starting to see more of, um, last minute. <laughs> uh, it's more without the child. We even know in brick and mortar, we've seen about a 25, 30% de decrease in kids on the trip for supplies this year than in the past. So I do think it this year is more about the transactional purchase versus that emotional connection of getting my child ready to go back with confidence and excited to go back. Right. So it's definitely a, uh, a unique period in back to school history. <laughs> Absolutely. So um, in, in summary, in terms of preparation, parents are having trouble preparing for the school year. Um, obviously, the uncertainty is driving it. They're spending more. Um, but at the same time, they're, it's not going to the, the phasing of it's not going to be as it was in the past. And there's new items that parents have to buy, whether it's mass or whether it's more technology. Um, so really, like it, it's, it sounds like it's it, everything is highly iterative in a fluid situation uh, for the CPGs that are, that are in this space. And it's really just responding to both the macro issue of the virus and how actually that impacts kids uh, learning curriculum, as well as just the individual demands um, and needs of families in terms of helping get through this. So, um, you know, I think and I agree that the most dynamic and agile brands are going to be the ones that are going to not only survive, but really thrive through this. Um, last week we heard about teachers, the impact on teachers. Um, so this is our last Ask the Marriage section of the day. Uh, what would you like us to ask our audience regarding teachers? One, what has been the most helpful tool you've seen teachers use for virtual teaching? Two, what could brands help more with for virtual teaching? Three, would you like to see from brands uh, to help support teachers? And four, what do you think the biggest challenge is for educators uh, teaching virtually or behind a mask? So you can select question you want us to answer our audience and we will go into our final section. So uh, let's not forget about the teachers. This is from Emily who's a teacher in Brooklyn and said, we feel ill prepared to meet this moment from behind our computers and behind our masks. And yet teachers are going to do what they always do. We're going to do the seemingly impossible and very little. Uh, parent, you know, teachers have always been uh, put at odds in terms of expecting to do um, the incredible, you know, uh, trying to teach and, and grow and develop, you know, 20, 25 kids with, with you know, a, a management team of one and often very limited resources to do so in a world where kids are increasingly distracted um, in a school environment. And now, you know, the ante has even been up uh, for teachers. Um, again, we talked about schools, many of which have not made a decision yet. Um, and they do feel at the same time that they are getting good guidance. Um, you know, this is teachers feel the Department of Education has given them good guidance because I think that most municipalities understand, I think, you know, the, the gravity of the situation. They're really trying to do everything they can possibly within, you know, the, the limitations that they have to give teachers good guidance on what to do. Um, Fifty-four percent of parent, uh, teachers will say that parents have been helpful uh, in, the, in the decision. 
many schools are having ongoing Zooms and webinars um, with parents to try to make it more of a community group decision. Yeah, I would say on this one too, Matt, the schools, districts have done a really good job of reaching out to parents, asking for their input, multiple surveys. Um, because you think about it, you mentioned this earlier with school districts, the local district is ultimately responsible in many cases of how they'll go back and the way. And school boards aren't necessarily trained <laughs> in that type yeah. of technical uh, administration of a building. So it truly has been a collaborative effort between the teachers, the administration, the board, and the parents. Yeah, it's been fascinating to see. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously, I mentioned earlier, teachers are still concerned about their health, which seems to get lost in all of this, uh, mm -hmm. as well as the health of, of their students. It, it's something that, you know, they're really putting themselves at risk. Um, I thought this was really interesting. Uh, Clorox donated a million dollars uh, to the Clear to List Foundation to provide resources for teachers and students, um, really to help give, you know, teachers the tools that they need to keep a sterile, clean classroom. Uh, so they can actually do anything that the teachers can actually feel better about the circumstances that they're in. Yeah. It's a great example of, uh, you know, a brand stepping it up for a cause that matters, again, in the place where a, they have a right to play. Uh, and I think that was fantastic to see. Um, and teachers are kind of across the board in terms of what they want. A third of them want schools to stay completely closed and teach virtual. Uh, well, over a half want them to reopen, but also offer virtual. So um, I think that parents, uh, I mean, teachers really are across the board. A lot of it, again, has to do with where they live because this virus has taken different forms over uh, an extended timeline in different areas of the country. Uh, so obviously in New York, where uh, the virus seems to be relatively under control, obviously teachers may have a different outlook than perhaps another state like Florida, where um, they've had a recent resurgence. Um, over half of teachers have been buying PPE in order to prepare for the school year. They know that they need to come uh, equipped into a school environment. Um, and unfortunately, many teachers are saying they're forced to choose between buying school supplies or or personal protective equipment. You know, the teachers have limited budgets. Um, many, um, you know, public sector budgets have had tremendous strain on it. New York City has just said that they're $8 billion on their budget and they're cutting everybody from, uh, you know, emergency service workers to police, uh, to police environment. And, you know, that they're, you know, in a really uh, tough situation and with it become coming more pressure on administrators and on teachers to basically cut budgets and make hard choices. So the fact that teachers actually have to make this choice is something that obviously is very disheartening. You know, they're trying to go in and, and teach students and they have to pick, do I put my health first or, 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 you know, the efficacy of my job as a teacher on the line. And that's kind of the, the downside of the situation that we're in right now. Uh, nearly half of the teachers are buying more technology for the upcoming school year um, because they know that no matter what, there will be at least some component of virtual learning. So not only do parents have to kind of speed up and adopt this virtual uh, learning curriculum, but obviously teachers do as well. And obviously much more of the burdens on them because they're the ones that have to keep kids engaged in a remote environment. You know, it's interesting, Matt, on that point. Yeah. Um, Teachers are also having to deal with the fact that you can't share supplies. Yeah. So now you have wow, to ensure right. that each child's supplies stay separate. And we're actually starting to see a trend in storage units have gone up. We've seen a trend in uh, green screens for virtual. Yeah. So it's just interesting yeah. the dynamics and the ripple effect of the pandemic on how just the pragmatic day-to-day, minute-to-minute, subject-to-subject, how teachers are adapting. Absolutely. Um, no resilient. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Um, Walmart's talking about, you know, and so many other brands are now also rethinking the way that they merchandise back to school in general. Um, you know, this is Walmart saying back to school season's here and however you go back, Walmart has your back. So this is an example of retailers and brands starting to change their messaging and their merchandising to really account for these, uh, you know, unforeseen times. So in summary, obviously teachers are equally as uncertain. Um, they're going to be increasing spending in certain ways, but really trying to make sure that they're balancing, obviously, the needs of their personal health as well as their efficacy um, of their teaching curriculums in a hybrid or remote or in-person environment. So just lots to balance from the teacher side. Um, so I think Abel is going to uh, jump on quickly, and he's going to give us results to our Ask America section, and then we're going to go into some Q&A. Hey, everyone. Um, so while, uh, while we were going through the webinar, we fielded these questions live for you all. Um, so the first question that we had here for everyone was, what brands do you expect to help you if your child remains home? Uh, so we field this exactly to a parent-only audience. 
Uh, and no surprise here, very similar survey. We saw a lot of tech brands here. So Samsung, uh, Microsoft, HP, Lenovo, Apple, uh, Zoo, Google. Uh, and then we saw some entertainment focus like Netflix. Uh, and then we saw some supply companies uh, like Crayola, which is awesome to see there. Uh, Lysol, Lego as well. Um, the next question that we had here is, what is your biggest concern uh, with preparing for back to school? Um, people are worried about the pandemic. They're worried about people uh, getting infected, health, uh, the virus. They're worried about their kids getting sick. Uh, they're worried about masks, the security, uh, their ability to kind of learn uh, in person and virtually. Uh, and then our final question here is, what would you like to see from brands to help support teachers? Again, feel that just to our uh, teacher audience on the Suzy platform. Uh, and what we saw is they would like help with equipment, with masks, uh, with donations, with supplies, materials, uh, with different technology and tools and discounts. So combination of actual physical materials uh, from donations mm -hmm. and different types of enablement um, for them as well. Really interesting. Thanks for uh, running that, Abel. So um, with the time we have left, we'd love to go into some questions. So Abel, what have we been getting from the audience? Yeah, definitely. Um, so one of the questions that people want to know about is uh, when it comes to education and kind of kids who are dealing with virtual Zoom fatigue, how can brands really help out there? Rick, you want to take this? How do we yeah, help I, I think the opportunity for hands-on, you know, just more tactile. Um, yeah. Anything that's going to allow them to use fine motor skills will certainly help. Um, where they're having to make choices with colors, they can pick something up and engage in a physical activity, I think will is a tremendous value and a big help. Even if Plus, maybe there's like a, a whiteboard or something that you're writing from and you're showing what you're handwriting so you're not typing, just something right. to, yeah, touch and feel. I agree 100%. Spot on. Definitely. Um, so from a Crayola perspective, what are new products that are being developed that are tailored to this new COVID-19 world? For example, new school in person means individual packets uh, versus at home means more on screen time, less written. Um, so how does that affect Crayola's new product development uh, since this could be a one to two year deal? Yeah, we're definitely looking at everything you just mentioned there. I think the idea of how su supplies are shared is something that's very interesting to us right now. But we're also looking at the idea of these emerging mediums, your paints, your compounds, beyond just ink or wax on paper, but really finding meaningful new creative ways to move beyond the paper and uh, almost three-dimensional creativity and uh, art. Definitely. Um, Rick, we were talking a little bit about it earlier, but the National Retail Federation, uh, they released a study earlier this summer that was saying that retail was actually um, supposed to be even higher this year for back to school than last year. Um, do you have any thoughts on, on that there? Um, I think it depends on the sector. I think technology, as Matt um, alluded to earlier, will definitely see some increases. I think because of the fact of the list dynamics, and the uncertainty of start, I think you're gonna see some traditional segments, footwear, apparel, lunch bags, even school supplies to a certain degree are, are gonna have some, uh, some sales to make up here in the next few weeks to see a positive for the end of the season. Definitely. Um, and I know Matt brought this up earlier as well, but just want to reiterate, we have the offer uh, till the end of this uh, webinar. If you want to conduct your own survey, if you want us to retarget back to uh, our teacher audience or our parents who are thinking about back to school, um, just reach out, click on the chat today, and uh, we're offering kind of a free um, question um, today just for you. Um, and now my next question here is, uh, for Rick, are you guys tailoring your messaging to consumers based on where students uh, are likely to go back to school, um, whether they're going in person or whether it's going to be remote learning? Um, I would say we have options on our, uh, our digital content to help parents with that. Um, as far as from a shopper marketing standpoint, I think what you've seen for most retailers, however you go back, we've got your back is a slogan that I think transcends across a lot of CPG right now yeah. and just ensuring that every ecosystem is up and running, whether it's brick and mortar, BOPUS, traditional e -com is all in play right now. Definitely. Um, and BOPUS, for those of you who know, is buy online, pick up at a store. Yeah. 
Thanks, Matt. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> So this is kind of an interesting question here, but what, what have you seen being developed to help keep kids engaged who don't really have reliable access to the internet? Uh, it seems a lot of brand efforts focus on that middle group uh, that aren't the haves, but do at least have internet. Um, you know, again, a box of crayons, a piece of paper can drive a tremendous amount of creativity and engagement. And I think through our, our create it yourself type videos where there's projects that they can do to engage them around physically building or making something and the art is important. I think it's also important to help parents understand how do you engage in meaningful discussion when your child has created something from the art side, the creativity side. And those are all tips, techniques that we do provide where you're getting away from the screen and you're engaging in visual art as a form of learning, form of discussion. Um, we've even got STEM and STEAM. You know, STEAM is science, technology, engineering, art, and math, and having ideas and projects where you actually can bring some STEM concepts in through design and art is also very interesting. And again, um, you know, it does take to get to the website, of course, which is challenging, but we do have um, other forms on the box, things like that, that you can lean into for ideas on how to use the product products. Definitely. Um, so kind of final question here for you, Rick, uh, what mm -hmm. media channels are being used by Crayola to engage with consumers this back to school season? And, and what has been the most successful that you've seen? I'm sorry, which channel, uh, which media channels? Um, we've done primarily through digital digital is, has been our, our go-to. Um, we found that um, that form of media through social, through our own website, through partnership with our customers has been the most effective tool to communicate and engage with shoppers. Um, our Crayola.com and Creative Learning at Home has been the most effective for engaging with consumers. But again, from a shopper standpoint, it's primarily through uh, activation with our customers. Customers being our retail accounts. Awesome. Well, that's really all the questions for the both of you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So, thank yeah, you. So, yeah. So, Abel, thank you so much to you and the marketing team at Suzy for, uh, as always, putting together a fantastic uh, webinar. I want to give a special thanks to Rick Stringer, uh, our dear friend from Crayola, for taking time out of his busy back to school schedule and for offering really incredible, compelling insights. So Rick, thank you so much for joining. Hopefully we can do one again. Maybe we'll do one for holiday season. Uh, yeah, my pleasure. Thank, thank you, Matt. Thank you. Yeah, it was great. It's able. Pleasure. Yeah, yeah. And uh, to all of our audience who has continued the call, and we really appreciate it. This is our 11th edition of the State of the Consumer Webinar. We have many more to go. I hope everybody enjoys what's left this summer and stays safe out there um, and is preparing for back to school the best <laughs> they can. So uh, on behalf of myself, uh, Rick Stringer from Crayola, Abel, and the rest of the Suzy team, thank you guys so much for joining. Uh, until next time. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.